I thank you for coming today. We're so happy, all of us here, as this is an accumulation of about a nine-month dream of mine to put this event on. And I know it's a, a day you have off, especially for the young guys and uh, for their parents also, but I'm very grateful. And hopefully we can make a difference today. Um, my name's Mike Carey. I was born in Philadelphia. I'm the oldest of six. My dad was a Philadelphia cop. I actually was just talking to my neighbor from Philadelphia. I lived on Independence Street in West Oak Lane. And uh, when we were about 12 years old, we moved out of that area and I ended up going to Taminen. From Taminen, I went to Central Bucks West and then I was fortunate enough to get an, a full scholarship to the University of Pittsburgh. When my, my playing career was over, I came back to Central Bucks in Doylestown area and thought that I would coach one year with Mike Patton. I was actually finishing up my degree at Pitt and I was student teaching right here at Lenape. What was one year ended up being 25 years and I eventually took over as the head coach there and uh, we had some success. Um, I also coached at North Penn, and then just recently, not that long ago, I, I coached five years at Archbishop Wood, which was just a great experience. Um, dream big, I'm just so glad that we gathered today here, and I'm asking you to listen to the speakers who were all handpicked, and we want you to leave inspired and to give you something to think about. And we want you to realize that the teenage years for all of us were, are and were filled with confusion at times, anxiousness, setbacks and struggles, successes and great times. All of this is what makes up a strong individual. And it also builds character. It's the, it's the, it's the uh, theory of absorbing all the hard hits that you can and you do in life and you gain experience from those, those issues and know how to handle the next one. And I can't emphasize enough to all of you that middle school and high school is one of the best times of your life. I'm fortunate that one of my best friends from, I met him when I was 12 years old at Taminen, we are still fantastic friends. And I'm also fortunate that I met my wife in the summer between 10th and 11th grade. Started dating her and took her to the junior and senior prom. And who would have thought? But 40 years later, we're still married. I love her dearly. So high school is a great time, but it's also a confusing time. But you have to be able to handle it, and you have to be able to grow from it. And you'll hear this through these great success stories of the speakers that are to my right and to my left. And you do have to know that going through difficult times or confusing times or things that makes you think because you haven't been through that before, this is all normal and part of the process. I want you to realize also that you gain experience in life and things get easier. Some of the kids are really young here today. Um, remember when you first started riding a bike or maybe you were, you were a high school kid and you helped your, your brother or sister trying to ride a bike. You know, first you put them on training wheels, then after a couple weeks, you're guiding them, holding on to the bike as they're trying to ride, and then in about two weeks later, you let them go, and there they go. They're off riding that bike. And what's the difference between that three weeks and the two weeks, or three weeks ago when you're on training wheels? That difference is the experience. How about when you, came, how about when you went into middle school, when you came into the school as a seventh grader? or go into CB West or CB East or South as a 10th grader. You walk into the building and it's just so vast, so big. You're like, what am I getting myself into? You go into a locker room or you go into your classroom and the kids look like they're adults. They're so big, the seniors. Again, I can relate a story. When I was at CB West, I was on the football team as a 10th grader. So in that time of the year, we went to camp three weeks before I went to a regular class. So I'm in camp, the first day I come into the locker room, I sit down because my name is a carry and it's with a C, they went by alphabetical order for the 10th graders. So here I am, I'm, my locker's right next to all the seniors. And I'm looking over saying, what did I get myself into? These guys are grown men, they're so huge. 
And then in a couple years, you know, the next year as 11th grader, I felt really I fit in, I, I, I fit in a lot better. And then my senior year, you're top dog. Whether it's a girl or a guy, you realize that it was a perception. And then your, your experience of gaining those two years as you go on makes things easier. So please stay focused as you listen to these stories today. Try to stack one good thought after another good thought. We all have bad days now and then. We all have great days. And as you get older, you realize if you go through a bad day, it's just something that comes along and that you're going to get through it. And you'll know that because you've gone through it before. And that's called experience. Now, the people to my right and my left, these are speakers that I handpicked. Literally, I have probably a half a dozen other people that wanted to speak at the event, and obviously we filled up pretty quick, but I'm just so grateful for these men, women, young girls, um, gentlemen that have dedicated their time for nothing. Some of them traveled from California, um, and some of them have, are, have, did, have done videos for us because of the fact that they're just so busy, like Colin Gillespie, who's going to speak via video. He's a point guard for the Denver Nuggets, and I'll talk more about him. But of course, they're playing the Lakers now for the Western, Western Finals, and obviously he's gotta be there. But I picked these speakers not just based upon their great character, but because they had to possess two things. One, they had a struggle in life at some point, and secondly, they had to find their way through that struggle to gain great success. And I promise all of you out there, if you listen intently and you just pick up one or two things here, you're going to be able to be inspired and be more optimistic about things going forward in life. How this event will work. Hopefully, most of you have programs. If you don't have a program, please raise your hand and our four ushers from CB West Football, uh, Rob Rome was gracious enough to give us four players. Uh, they will come over and give you a program because the program lists the bio of all the speakers and you'll see it's pretty um, impressive. So you have a program and it shows you the order of the speakers. Uh, Mr. Roseman will be going live with us here at one o'clock. So at some point we're gonna have to stop the program and he'll be up on the screen there. My, Mike and myself here will be uh, peppering him with questions, and he's got a story that's second to none, a non-football player who is now the NFL Executive of the Year. Um, so that Zoom is at 1 o'clock. We also have two videos. One is of Justin Guarini, and you might not know him if you're in high school today, but he's one of the top producer directors on Broadway. He's also the actor in the new Dr. Pepper commercial, and he was runner-up for Idol back in 2013, 2014. He is uh, in production right now on Broadway, and he did a great article, excuse me, a great video. He actually went to Lenape and then went to CB East. Um, classrooms, when we are done here, I think we have a unique uh, situation here and I wanted to do it from day one. We have five classrooms that are right outside and they're all labeled. And they'll be broken up by groups, sports, medicine, uh, journalism and business, uh, law enforcement. What am I missing? There's one other one. Those rooms, if you wanna go into those rooms and go one-on-one -on -one with the speakers, that would be great. If you wanna go into two of the rooms, three of the rooms, where you can ask questions one-on-one, -on -one, maybe it's about a career, uh, possibility, maybe, you know, how did you get there when you were, what were you thinking when you were in uh, high school? Or just want to hear them talk further, in depth, because they are on a time limit up here. If you don't want to go into the classrooms, you don't have to. We appreciate you coming today. Uh, in the program also, at the end, is my bio. If you look at the bottom of my bio, you'll see my email there. I'm offering, that's my personal email, to anyone out there that wants to email me at any point whether it's today, 10 weeks from now, some night, you have a question, you want me to get answered by one of the speakers, you just want to talk to somebody, or you want, to re want me to reach out. You, you contact me with that email and I'll be right there. Um, at this point, we're gonna get started here. I wanna introduce Mike Mooseberger, 
Mike is a very, very close friend of mine. I first met Mike when he was uh, in 10th grade at CB East. I was coaching at, at CB West. And of course, we were game planning. And uh, my center, Todd Ryan, was 5'11", 225 pounds. And I was actually frightened to, to tell him, oh yeah, you know, the guy you're gonna be playing against this week is 6'8", 235 pounds. So I actually put in the program that he was 6'1", 215. So, uh, I put it out, and that's the uh, thing we hand out to our players. I don't know, Jamie, does it run out of? Looks like the battery went. Okay. So anyway, that, that's the handout we give the players at the beginning of the week. It's a scouting report. So I remember the first series, Todd came running out to me and he goes, they must have got a transfer, they must have got a transfer. The guy is like a monster. And uh, I just respected Mike, had a great career, went to Wake Forest on a full ride, um, has had some major, major situations in his life that he's had to fight through, crawl through, and uh, me and him have developed a really, really strong relationship. Mike, after college, went to uh, Canada and played for the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Bombers and presently is a uh, business owner, entrepreneur in the oil and gas business. So Mike is going to speak a couple of minutes and then he's going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. So, good afternoon, everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces out here, both athletes that I've trained, spoken to, some parents as well. So, I appreciate you guys coming today. Appreciate the opportunity to address you and also speak to you again here. Um, I won't take too much time talking about my story. A lot of you have heard it already. The opportunity today is really to hear from these individuals over here. Um, I think. Mike touched on this originally when he first introduced this, but a lot of us get to a point where we feel like we're the only ones that have ever felt that way. Boyfriend, girlfriend breaks up with us, we lose a game, we lose a business deal, whatever the case may be. And the fact of the matter is, for old, young, and everybody in between, what we want to try to get across to you today is that we've all felt that way, okay? Some of us just hide it better, all right? We all have problems. I did a, a talk up at East last year, uh, and I literally, an hour before the talk, I had an anxiety attack. And it's the first thing I told the kids, and I saw an audible sigh across the auditorium. So my point in telling you this, old, young, and everybody out there is today, what I hope you can get out of this today is, you're not alone, right? We all have struggles regardless of where we're at, whether we're a professional athlete, whether we're a sheriff's deputy, whether we're a business owner, we're a doctor, a nurse, right? We're all facing those same challenges, okay? And the keys, of how to get over those challenges or something that you guys are all going to learn today and I hope you get a big value add to take away from something, okay? Our first speaker, and you guys have programs, so I don't want to spend too much time on her accolades. Her story is going to be fantastic, okay? It's Deputy Christina Brewerton and my new friend Zeke, okay? Deputy Brewerton started out in 2006. She started her career as a police dispatcher with 911. After that, she decided to enter the sheriff's program and created the first canine program for the Bucks County Sheriff's Department. Her story, I think you'll find about determination, willpower. She can tell it better than I. Everybody, please give a warm round of applause for Deputy Christina Brewerton. Thank you. Thank you. This isn't going to work. <laughs> okay. You're so small, you're a girl. He's so skinny, he's so shy. Why is he like this? My name's Christina and those are the things that people would say about me and my partner Zeke. We're both here to tell you that you can do anything. At times you might feel alone or like you don't have any true friends, but life gets better. After I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to help people in crisis. So in 2007, I started working for our county 911 center just like what you see on TV. That dispatcher that saves a choking baby, I did it. That dispatcher who hears a cop in a gunfight or a car chase, I did that too. 
The job was exciting, but I still wanted to help people in crisis face to face. So I left to become a sheriff deputy. I was told I was too small. People talked about me behind my back, and I'm sure they still do. They'd say things like, she should be a secretary. Her uniform is kid size. <laughs> yeah. So during my first attempt at becoming a deputy, I, I failed my physical test by two sit-ups. But I used that failure and those insults to fuel my physical training for sheriff school the following year. In 2018, I came back strong and determined to get the job, and I got it. A few years into being a deputy, I was able to use the skills that I had learned at 911 to interview for a hostage negotiator position on our SWAT team. A few days later, the email came that I had made the team. So while I'm not the big guy breaking down the doors to the house, I am a calm voice to talk to when people are having a bad day, and it's the part of the job that I love, the problem-solving part. But since I'm being honest here in front of all of you, to this day, sometimes I feel like it's me versus everyone, and I still feel like I don't belong. But guess what? These doubts fuel me to be the best version of me that I can be. These doubts push me to show up every day, no matter what's being said about me, and do the job that I know I can do. They push me to learn more, work hard, and be better. I find confidence knowing that Zeke and I can take on anything with a smile and a wagging tail. So usually, vulnerability is not my thing. But it's so important for everyone to know that it's not just you that feels this way. It's not just you that's insecure, adults still feel it. Your time to shine will definitely come, and all those people that doubted you will have no choice but to see you win. I heard someone use the analogy of a tunnel when it comes to feeling stuck in a dark place. At your age, it's okay not to know where you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to do. Tunnels take us places that we don't get to go to unless we go through them. Yes, they're dark, sometimes scary, but if we keep walking through them, eventually we'll end up on the other side of something that can be amazing. So while you might feel confused or lost in a dark place or time, I'm here to ask you to just keep walking. Make it to tomorrow, make it to the day after. You might feel like you have no clue what to do with your life, and that's okay. You're gonna gain some friends, you're gonna lose some friends, but life goes on, you just keep pushing. For me, I had to do a lot of humbling work to get to the canine position that I'm at. There I was at a job that I loved, wearing a uniform that finally fit. I had a boss who was super supportive, but for almost a year I was assigned to a desk job, an assignment that was not my choice. Day in and day out I sat there thinking, if you hate this assignment, which I hated that assignment, why not create something you love? So I started researching canine unit information during downtime. Networking at that desk paid off in a huge way, and our canine unit was born in September of 2022 with the donation of not one, but two canines, thanks to the Hometown Foundation. So back to the tunnel. My partner, Zeke, who you'll see, is a prime example of someone that was stuck in a tunnel. Zeke was starved, he was neglected, he was abused. We rescued him from someone who should have been taking care of him. You'd think he would hate people after that, but he doesn't. He taught me that no matter how life beats you up, you can always find a way to come back and punch it in the face and be the success story. Today, the two of us are a prime example of true underdogs. I was told I was too small. I don't belong in this field, but here I am. Zeke was made fun of, and now he's canine Zeke, explosive detection dog. It took a lot of hard work to get where we are as a team and we continue to work at it daily. But I wanna reassure you that you will all find your people. The ones who believe in you, the ones who believe in your ideas. You may need help along the way and there are so many good humans out there that are willing to guide you, they're willing to listen and give you a hand. 
In closing, we all find out that life is hard. Friendships are hard, but you'll survive. All the experiences that I've had have led me to where I am now because I choose daily not to give up on myself or my partner. If you take away anything from this talk, just know there are people willing to help guide you if you need a hand, and life will get better. Just keep swimming. That was awesome. What an inspiring story. Amazing. You're really taller than I thought you were. <laughs> so keeping in line with inspiring stories, uh, our next speaker is uh, one of my former players. And it, it's, again, amazing when you look back. I started coaching him when, I guess he was 15, 16 years old when I went to Wood in 2010. And I could see right away that the guy was going to be a Division I player as, as a junior in high school, and not only to become a, a big-time recruit, but he was um, recruited by all the big schools in the country, played in the All-American All-Star game, and I, and I let him finish up, you know, but he's had a career that's, if anything was about persistence, his career surely is. Uh, presently, he's with the Carolina Panthers. Uh, he's been with the New York Giants, the Bears, and a couple other teams. Uh, born and raised in Doylestown, Colin Thompson. Currently a free agent, just to clear the air. Unemployed. <laughs> Howie Roseman will be on later. Maybe somebody can convince him to sign me. Uh, I'll be, first off, great to see everybody. I'll be honest, uh, I played in front of 100,000. I've had some really mean people try to take my head off or across from me, but I'm pretty nervous for this, just to, to, to back, because you know we have, what, 500 people, hopefully, I don't know, 250 people here, and this place is so near and dear to my heart to see my family and friends. It's, uh, it's a little bit emotional, I'll be honest with you. Um, so, like Mike said, uh, and, and first I'll say this, to all the parents out there and the mentors in this community, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of you can look back and you'll say the 10, 15, 20 people that had amazing impact on your life, uh, about five of them are in the room right now for me. So you never know who they are for the parents and mentors, so keep on keeping on, and uh, we appreciate what you do for the people in this community. So grew up in Doylestown. Uh, my parents uh, are business owners in this area, and our kitchen tables were a little unique, uh, to say the least. They were about retail and real estate and goal setting and visualization and passion. And you know, my parents would always say, what are your passions? What are your passions? And my passion was always people, communicating, and football, sports. Um, so, you know, one day my mom says, you need a vision board. You keep talking, you wanna play in the NFL, you wanna do all these things in football, you need a vision board. Well, how do I do that? Figure it out. Get a tack board, so my dad puts a tack board up in my room. I go to my computer, I Google image tight ends in the NFL. One of the first tight ends that popped up, who I always was a fan of, was Jeremy Shockey. There's, there was plenty on the board, Antonio Gates, Tony Gonzalez, Jason Witten, but Jeremy Shockey. For some reason, he was in the middle. It was the biggest picture. I'll never forget it, and, I, and it will be relevant to the story um, down the line. So I have the vision board in my room, and like I said, it will be relevant down the line here. So uh, I make the tough decision to go to Archbishop Wood. It was the best decision I ever made from being a Doylestown kid, not to play CBE, CB West rivalry game I grew up going to. So fast forward, it's my senior year. We win a state title. We're on one of the best teams in the history of the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, it was the best time of my life. Uh, I had the opportunity to go play to the University of Florida on a full scholarship. I was a first team All-American. The times were high. Uh, it was just unbelievable, it, it really was. And about 100 yards from here, in the left corner of this end zone, like I always would be by myself, I actually was with some buddies that day, 
And I was always, I always ran the stadium steps at CB West. I would look out into Doylestown, look out into the hospital. And I was doing cone drills, because I'm slow and still slow. And Mike would tell me that. He would say, Thompson, run your fastest 40. I'm like, Mike, what's my fastest 40? Uh, five flat, but he's like, you better run it all the time. So Mike made me crazy, and that's why I'm talking to you guys today. Um, but I was going around a cone, and my foot snapped. And I went to Doylestown Hospital over here, and they're like, hey, you got a broken foot. And really, it was the beginning of the end of my career. Uh, that happened in, I think, April of 2012. And then I went to the University of Florida, and I broke it again in August of 2012. And then one year later, I had an avicular stress fracture, which held Joel and beat out for most of his career in, what was that, September of 2013. And uh, the University of Florida said, hey, we're going to fly your parents down for Thanksgiving. I'm like, okay, great. Why are you flying my parents down? They're like, hey, your career's over. You can never play football again. It's done. We want you to be able to run around with your kids, coach sports. You're done. You can't play. So, you know, I come to you here seven years, going on seven years in the NFL, and it's been an amazing journey, an amazing ride. Um, and there's a lot of people I could thank for it. I'm not doing that today, but... Really what I'm coming to you today about, guys, is, and we go back to that vision board again, just a couple stories. The first one is, um, I'll never forget this, my mom pulled me out of school when the New York Giants won the Super Bowl. And she's like, and we weren't really Giants fans, we just were fans of the NFL. And she says, you know, you talk about the NFL all the time, you need to go see this, you need to see this Giants Super Bowl parade. And I remember Colts for Elementary calling my mom, saying it's not a legitimate excuse for your mom to, for you to miss school. My mom's like, yes, it is. My son needs to see this. He wants to play in the NFL one day. And everyone looks like you got four heads, of course. But here I am today. And, and funny enough, I find myself, whatever that was, 20 years later at that point in time, eating lunch with Eli Manning, telling him that story, uh, you know, almost on a daily basis with the New York Giants because people ask about me all the time. And then the next story goes back to that vision board and Jeremy Shockey. So uh, I'm a more physical player, uh, wasn't throwing the ball a ton. Mike wouldn't throw it to me in high school. I, they didn't throw me the ball in college either. But blocking tight end, I was an undrafted tight end, wasn't highly rated coming out into the NFL. And the New York Giants signed me undrafted. So super excited, dream come true, extremely emotional day, unbelievable opportunity. That's crazy, I have Giants on my vision board. My mom took me to the Super Bowl parade there. Like just so many things in line that were all about goal setting, dream chasing, your purpose, your drive, following your passions. And when you're an undrafted player, you don't really have a lot of say of like, you know, what cleats you have, how my pads fit. Like, you just show up, and it's great. It's like freshman football over again. You're like, just give me the – put the ball down and let's go. It, it's kind of freeing in a way. And there's my buzzer as I'm talking too long as always. And I'll wrap the story up here and goes back to that vision board. So, of course, you don't pick your jersey number. And Jeremy Shockey were number 80. And uh, they had Evan Ingram, who was a first-round pick, the same year I went to the Giants. He walked in. He picked his jersey number. He sat right next to Odell Beckham Jr. I was, like, stuffed in a locker in the back corner. And I turned the corner – and number 80, New York Giants, Thompson on the back was on there. And Jeremy Shockey poster was on my wall, number 80 with the New York Giants growing up. So, hey, it may be a mistake, it may be what it is, but the bottom line is realize your dreams and goals, align them with your purpose, your passion, and just relentlessly get after it and find a way because it worked out for me and it will work out for you too. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks for your time. Great stuff, Colin. So for the athletes out there, just a quick point, right? Colin heard no a lot over the course of his career. The average NFL career is about two and a half or three years. We all know NFL stands for not for long. So that guy is on year seven after hearing no and overcoming a lot of odds. So think about that, young fellas. Our next speaker, really excited. I could use his entire time up here talking about his awards and his accolades, but it's better that you hear it from him. He is the first print journalist inducted into the Pennsylvania Sports Hall of Fame. He is a six-time Emmy Award winner, 
for NFL Films. And most impressive to me, his name is on the Writer's Honor Roll at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Everybody, please give me a warm welcome for Ray Dinger. Hi, everyone. Um, glad you could all come out. This is a, a very, very important day. Uh, and uh, how about a round of applause for the guy who put it all together, Coach Mike Carey. <laughs> Success is a choice. It's not a gift, and it's certainly not an accident. It's a choice. It's a choice that you make. You set a goal, then you work to achieve it. It starts with you. You heard Colin talk about goal setting. That is where it starts. You can have the best GPS in the world, but unless you enter a destination, that GPS is useless. You have to know where you want to go. If you're just walking around with no real plan, hoping that maybe you'll find something. Well, maybe you'll get lucky, but maybe I'll get lucky isn't really a plan. I spent 50 years as a sports journalist, so I've interviewed Super Bowl champions, Olympic champions, heavyweight champions, super achievers, everyone. They played different sports, but they had two things in common. Talent, obviously but also they had a plan. Do any of you really think that Tom Brady one day just decided on a whim to play pro football? No. As a kid growing up in the Bay Area, he watched Joe Montana lead the 49ers to four Super Bowl titles. And he set a goal that one day he would play quarterback in the NFL. He wound up winning six Super Bowls, the last one when he was 43 years old. I could tell you similar stories about LeBron James, Wayne Gretzky, and Bryce Harper. Tiger Woods was hitting golf balls on The Tonight Show when he was five years old. Dawn Staley was beating the boys on the playgrounds in North Philadelphia when she was eight years old. So when they achieved greatness, it wasn't a fluke and it wasn't an accident. It was a plan that came to fruition through sacrifice, hard work, and a 24-7 sense of purpose. Now I'm not saying that you can all go out and win a Super Bowl, marry a supermodel, and live on a 60-foot yacht. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that you can all be successful, but you first need a clear vision of what it is that you want to do. Maybe it's music, maybe it's education, maybe it's business, maybe it's sports, maybe it's journalism, maybe it's the military. You'll hear about all of that here today. But first, you have to find it. Then you can start your journey. For me, it started in the fifth grade. The teacher read one of my essays aloud in class, and she concluded by saying, Mr. Dittinger, you should be a writer. It was the first time in my life that anybody ever told me I was good at something. And honestly, it changed my life. When I went to high school, I wrote for the student newspaper, and I won the school essay contest. When the principal handed me that $25 savings bond at the next assembly, the prize didn't matter as much as the sense that I was onto something. Maybe I can be a writer, and that was my GPS moment. From there, it was on to journalism school, and then a job writing sports at the Philadelphia Bulletin. How many of you here remember the Philadelphia Bulletin? Thank you, bless you. <laughs> You know, I thought I would be a newspaper man my whole life, but here's another lesson. Be open to any and all possibilities. 
In 1986, Philadelphia newspapers went on strike. We thought it would last a few days. It lasted two months. The local television stations hired a few of the striking columnists like me to bring their opinions to television, and I was one of them. Now, I had never had any great desire to be on television, but it beat walking a picket line, so I did it. When the strike finally ended, the station asked me to stay on, which I did. And then that led to an offer from Sports Talk Radio, and then later a job as a producer at NFL Films. None of that was part of my plan. Writing was my plan, but the writing provided those other opportunities. The moral of the story is your plan, no matter how carefully you map it out, can have some surprises. The road you start on may have some unexpected twists and turns, but see those surprises as opportunities. Don't be afraid of challenges. Over the years, I wrote thousands of newspaper columns, books, and TV scripts. But there was one story I had not told, and that was the story of my 40-year friendship with the great Eagles receiver, Tommy McDonald. It started when I was a 10-year-old boy and asked for his autograph, and it carried on years later when, as a sports writer, I led a campaign that helped Tommy achieve the thing he wanted most in his life, and that was a place in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I knew that was a great story, and I wanted very much to tell it. So one day, I sat down, and I did something I had never done. I wrote a play. I wrote a play called Tommy and Me. It debuted at Plays and Players Theater in Philadelphia in 2016, and I am happy to say, on May 19th, it will begin a one-month run at the Bucks County Playhouse, right down the road here in New Hope. I hope some of you, all of you, can come out and see it, experience it. It is also currently being produced into a movie. The point is that dreams can come true. That cliche you always hear about dreams coming true, they can come true. But it has to start with a plan, and it has to start with a purpose. In other words, it starts with you. So let it start today. Thank you all. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Tremendous. Wow, what an inspiring, inspiring story. Our next speaker is another one that's gone through ups and downs in her life. She has had many injuries. She had um, to do extra years of schooling to become the doctor that she aspired when she was in middle school. Um, she played Division I basketball, which when you, if, as some of these people, obviously most of them are Division I athletes, juggling a Division I sport along with your academic workload is a very difficult thing. I mean, you, you can look at me and, and say that I didn't do very much academically. I went into the University of Pittsburgh with um, a major in mind, switched at my end of my freshman year, switched again in my junior year to my third, and then eventually went back for my fourth major because I didn't like the other three, when in reality, I was just there to play football. So to do, be a professional, be a doctor, and be a Division I player, all while battling major, major knee surgeries is quite an accomplishment. And the reason I know this is because Devin Smith, who is the OBGYN surgeon I am introducing, is my third daughter. So on that note, Devin Carey Smith. Hi, everyone. 
So as he introduced me, I'm Devin Carey Smith. Um, I'm a Bucks County native and an alumnus here from Lenape Middle School. I'm currently a urogynecologist, which is a pelvic reconstructive surgeon for many of you that don't know what that means, um, at Cooper Hospital in Camden, New Jersey. I wanted just to talk to you all for a couple of minutes about my story in hopes that it can relate to some of you and hopefully you can learn from my experiences. So I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with something called grit. Um, coincidentally, I just saw there was a poster out there that has it on it, but um, grit is something I just recently learned there was an actual term for. Grit is defined as the combination of passion and perseverance in an effort to achieve a long-term long goal. My story and process to get to where I am today really is defined by this term and is something I still take pride in as I continue to strive towards this. My early life growing up was heavily focused on athletics, um, specifically basketball. Whether it was my initial dream or more of a copycat effect for my older siblings, the ultimate goal was to play Division I basketball. I was never spectacular. I was good, but really had average height, average speed, and average natural talent. But I overcame a lot of it with the skills I developed through hours of work and practice, whether it was forced or elective. <laughs> um, I earned my way to earn a college scholarship at my dream, Loyola University in Maryland. Unfortunately, just months after committing to Loyola, in the second game of my senior year of high school, I suffered a season-ending knee injury by tearing my ACL. To, the, to me, at this time, this was the most devastating thing that had ever happened to me. My life up until this point was basketball, and that was really all that defined me. My senior season and picture-perfect senior year was washed down the drain. And even worse, I had about nine months of ruling rehab before me to eventually play again. Looking back, it's a blur, but I can remember there were many, many tears, hard days, sore muscles, and unmotivating workouts I forced myself to get through. But really, without hesitation, I took it one day at a time, one week at a time, and one month at a time to get back through those workouts and back to the court about 10 months later. So now I was at Loyola, beginning my freshman season just one month in, and during a very routine cutting drill or running drill, I cut the wrong direction and blew up my knee again. I immediately felt the same frustration and really devastation of losing yet another season and having to undergo that rehab journey all over again. I definitely had my own doubts, as well as others did, um, about whether or not you know, she could get through it, but I knew right away I could. I was just taking it again, just one day at a time, and had faith um, that I could return to playing again. So, and to be honest, there was many times that myself and others thought it was completely understandable to end my career there. I was by no means heading to the WNBA, or at this point, likely even contributing significantly to my college team again. But it didn't matter. I had my mindset, and I really think it was that grit that helped me get through. So fast forward to my senior year. Not only was I able to play again, but I even had the opportunity to start and did contribute. I really was never the player I was before, don't get me wrong, but just being able to step on that court again was the achievement I had dreamed of conquering. So while athletics really did teach me what grit was, it wasn't until I carried it through to my professional life that I really understood its impact. Even while basketball was the biggest part of my life for so many years, I decided early on, literally one day after biology class here in Lenape, um, doing frog dissections, I think, that I wanted to become a surgeon. And my mind was met, made up. And trust me, similar to athletics again, I was by no means a very great student. I was a good student, but it never came easy to me. If I earned good grades, it's because I put in the work. And I really quickly realized how much work it would take to have a career in medicine. So at Loyola, while bouncing basketball, workouts, rehab, and majoring in pre-med, I decided to go to medical school. I struggled more in school than I ever did while taking these pre-med classes. I took countless summer classes, had endless um, tutors, did a ton of study hall, and it was still a major struggle. I still remember one of my college professors who was actually the head of the pre-med department telling me that I should become a physical therapist instead because he said I literally put or athletics over my academics and I had slim to no chance of getting into medical school and I would save a lot of time and a lot of money trying to do it. So even with this advice, it never seemed to phase or falter me. I just knew I had to put in more work and find another way. So after graduating college, I took out student loans, took a year of grad classes, um, prepared for my MCAT test to get into medical school, did another year of research, and finally applied to medical school. I applied to over 45 schools and got rejection after rejection. Then one day in December 2011, I can still remember it very clearly, I got my one and only acceptance letter. That was all it took. One acceptance and one door to open. 
I still think of this honestly as my biggest professional accomplishment to this day. And I really know it was accredit accredited to my grit. Because looking back on my story, it's a pretty easy one to tell in a couple of minutes. But the long days which eventually led into years of studying, the accumulation of many, many student loans, <laughs> the rejections, the hurdles, the sacrifice of putting my life on hold for years to accomplish this goal was by no means for the faint of heart. Anything like this really takes more than just a commitment. It's the work you have to put in every day, the passion you need to continue the drive, the ability to overcome the big and small obstacles because there will always be obstacles. So after all of it, four years of college, a year of grad school, a year of research, four years of medical school, and seven years of training in OBGYN and specializing in urogynecology, <laughs> I'm finally embarking on my first real job as an independent physician and surgeon. So hopefully you can use my story as an example and it can show some of you that you really don't have to be the most naturally gifted or talented to achieve even your highest goals. It's having grit and perseverance to get you to where you want to be. Thank you. What a great story. Thank you, Devin. Awesome perseverance, overcoming obstacles, although I, I think despite all your achievements, what's more impressive is you survived this guy's voluntary workouts. Yeah, I, I know about those as well, Devin. So our next speaker, he can't be here today in person. Uh, he's going to video in, but it's a friend of mine, uh, Justin Gorey. Justin and I grew up together. He is a Lenape alum. He has had a 20 plus year successful career in the entertainment industry, which I would say is as hard, maybe even harder of getting in as professional sports. So Justin is a guy who was the first runner up on American Idol. He has done Broadway. He has done film and entertainment. He is now a best selling author. Uh, on a personal note, I've known Justin since we were young. And one thing I can say for Justin, as you've heard from some of our other speakers, Justin always had goals, even at an early age. He was the kid. He was singing the national anthem at our games. He was never missing an opportunity to work on his craft. He had a very clear, defined goal of where he wanted to go, even from an early age. So uh, as wonderful he is, excuse me, as wonderful a talent as he is, he is a better person. I see him often, and uh, I always get the same guy, big smile on his face, lots of positivity. So Justin's going to, is he zooming in, or is this a recording mic? Okay, it's a video, so if everyone turn your attention to the screen, we're going to hear from Justin Guarini. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here with you virtually to speak with you about an important topic that is close to my heart. Today, I'd like to share with you some ideas about why a career in the arts could be right for you. A career in the arts can offer you new and unexpected ways to break out of the more traditional kinds of jobs that you'll be hearing about today from the great lineup of speakers that are here. Now, I know, wait, you might be thinking, wait, 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 the arts, that's just for people who want to be famous, but I actually couldn't be further from the truth. The arts community is so much more than just Hollywood actors and pop stars. In fact, it's actually a diverse and inclusive community that offers many different paths and opportunities for success. And well, I know that the challenges that many of you are facing today at the age you're at and the time in history that we're at feel like they're never ending. And that sometimes, if not a lot of the time, you feel like you're doing it alone. And the idea of taking on like one more responsibility in the real world, no matter what job interests you here, or what line of work interests you here, it just can feel overwhelming. My 18 year old is about to graduate high school from West and she's excited but also terrified of what comes next. But hey, that's life and life can be tough and it can be hard to find a supportive and accepting community sometimes. And that is where the arts community comes in. It's a place where people come together to express themselves, support each other and create something beautiful together. So whether you're a painter or a dancer or a musician or a writer, there is a place for you in the arts community. And another one of the great things about the arts is that there are so many different ways to express yourself like maybe you're not interested in traditional art forms like painting or sculpture and that's okay there are plenty of other ways to get creative maybe you're into graphic design a lot of money there or you like to write poetry maybe you love to dance but you don't want to do ballet and that is absolutely okay too there are so many different styles of dance from hip-hop to ballroom and everything in between the point is, is that there are so many great ways to express yourself and Look, speaking of self-expression, let's not 
forget about the benefits of self-expression. The arts offers a unique ex opportunity to explore your feelings and emotions in a safe and supportive environment in a healthy way. Look, whether you're feeling sad, happy, angry, or confused, there is a form of artistic expression that can help you make sense of your feelings and again, find a way to express them in a healthy way. A life and a career in the arts can help you discover new things about yourself and the world, as well as help you recover from the wounds of the past. So you can create the future that you desire. But wait, let's get down to brass tacks. What about success and money in the arts? I mean, come on, let's get real. Isn't that success and that money, isn't that just for the stars? No, not at all. There's so many different jobs and roles within the arts community that can lead to a fulfilling, most important, and successful career. Look, maybe you want to be a set designer or a lighting technician or a costume designer. Maybe you want to work in arts administration, helping manage and promote cultural events. Maybe you want to be a teacher, passing on your love of the arts to the next generation. Again, there's so many different ways that you can be a part of the arts community especially if you hate the idea of getting up on the stage or in front of the camera, but love the idea of being part of a show or a production. I mean, what a lot of people don't know is that what you see on the screen, uh, on the stage, and in countless arts productions is supported by hundreds and sometimes thousands of creatives and artists. So as you can see, the arts offer a world of opportunity for those who are willing to explore it. And I want to encourage you to do just that. Don't be afraid to try something new, to express yourself in a different way, or to pursue a career in the arts. You might just find that it offers you a sense of hope and direction in life that you might not know that you've been looking for. I'm so happy to be able to be here, even if it isn't in person, because I get to pass on a message that completely changed my life. And I hope that you get this one thing. You don't have to be a star to be successful in the arts. The arts community is diverse, inclusive, welcoming to everyone. And there's so many different ways to express yourself and many, many different paths to success. So I encourage you to go out there and explore the world of the arts. Who knows where it might take you and who knows how many people you can inspire and how many people's lives you can change just by doing something that you love expressing yourself in your own unique way. I wanna thank you for your time and thanks to my coach from my Lenape days of football, Coach Benstead, for inviting me to be a part of this event. Be well, and I wish you all the very best. Okay, so I think now we have about five minutes before we're going to zoom in with uh, the Eagles general manager, Howie Rosman. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you hear me? Mr. Rosman, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your childhood? We know you grew up in, in Brooklyn, and uh, tell us a little bit about your family, and then maybe lead into high school. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I, I love these events where I get to talk to people who are able to dream big and to understand that if you're passionate and determined in whatever field you're in, it doesn't matter if it's football, if it's sports, if it's business, you got an edge up on everyone. So, um, you know, for me, that was my edge. I just knew what I wanted to do in life. And I was fortunate that uh, people gave me the opportunity to learn and do things the right way. And, um, Obviously, you know, I'm a product of the people that inspired me and that I'm around. Thank you. Could you possibly tell us about how you, where you grew up, a little bit about your childhood, and at, growing into your teenage years, and what your aspirations were at, at that time? Yeah, you know, I always had this um, unbelievable passion and interest um, in sports, obviously um, in football, but um, I wrestled in high school at 119 pounds, so nobody was giving me the opportunity to play quarterback for them. Um, but I loved the idea of team building. I loved the idea of putting people together, fitting the parts together. I loved that at an early age. And so, you know, I just wrote a, a ton of letters trying to make connections with people. I tried to do the best I could academically. Um, whether it was in high school or college, or then I went to grad school just to make myself um, more appealable to employ employers. 
and obviously just trying to, to meet and talk to as many good people as I possibly could. You were mentioning the process of, of uh, you wrote a bunch of letters. So when you, when did you decide at what age that you would like to go try to get into management or help out in the NFL? You know, I was fortunate that really young I wanted to go in this direction. I used to watch football games and, and just love how they kind of drafted players, how they picked players. And then I went to the University of Florida because I had a lot of admiration for how they played offensive football. Um, and so I used to tell people when I was 12 years old, I, I thought I was going to be a quarterback in the NFL. I got a reality check pretty early in life on that. And then I really kind of was going through that when I was 12 and 13, trying to get the NFL, writing letters, trying to make connections. I didn't know anyone. I didn't have any connections in the NFL. Um, and then I was fortunate at the University of Florida to have my college roommate, who um, just happened to be in the same fraternity as I. He's now the, co the head coach of the University of Arizona. He was the same way, really determined in that way. And I think when you're that determined and you're that persistent and, and you do the right things, it gives you a chance. Yeah, your story is, is, is compelling and uh, it, it's so unusual for the NFL or to get into the MLB or, or the NBA. Um, tell me about, you said you wrote letters. Obviously you were turned down. Were people even answering you or were you not getting any responses or did you get a few interviews? And um, how, did, how, do you, how did they feel about you not being a college football player trying to get into almost like a closed society? Yeah, I think the first thing is, you know, I think we got to be re comfortable with rejection. We got to be comfortable with the word no. I think it's so much easier for people to tell everyone no than yes, that if you're really um, affected by the one or two no's or the rejection, it's hard to overcome that. I mean, the most successful people in life, they have adversity. Nobody's life is a straight line. Everyone's going to have ups and downs, roller coasters in life, life and it's how you react to that. And I think that um, there were so many people. I mean, I, I have rejection letters floor to ceiling from NFL teams who are saying, no, 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 no. Um, and I just kind of kept at it. Now it was a different time. The world was different. It wasn't as interconnected as it is now. But um, I didn't get a chance to interview for a team until um, I, I was in law school and I got a chance to interview for the Jets uh, for an internship job. And um, what happened there was they just brought me in because they had seen how many times I wrote thank you letters for being rejected and they brought me in to talk to me and it actually led me to the Eagles because uh, there was this joke about this stalker who um, wouldn't stop trying to communicate with both teams and uh, the Jets called the Eagles and said they brought me in and it got me an internship at the Eagles and I think that's the other thing it's like none of this starts at the top every path starts at the ground level and you got to be willing to do whatever it takes at whatever opportunity you get no matter how hard it is to move up howie can you talk a little bit about that that moment where you're struggling and i call it the turn back moment right where you had to make a decision maybe you were getting discouraged in yourself you weren't getting the responses that you that you liked you thought maybe this is the wrong decision for me maybe i'm on the wrong path did you have one specific moment where you sort of felt that and if you did how did you overcome that yeah for sure you know um, i was fortunate because um i was around such great people when i first started my, my job with coach reed and his staff and Tom Heckard and his staff. And then I got a GM job in, in 2010. And, um, you know, in 2015, I kind of lost my job and uh, everything that came with that and all the articles and, you know, kind of a public humili humiliation with that went with that and not really thinking I would get the opportunity to ever get it back. And so you kind of question at that moment, maybe you should do something else. Is it worthwhile? And um, you know, I kind of um, took a lot of stock of myself and how I can improve myself. And I went around the country. I was very fortunate to be able to do that and meet with teams and coaches and business leaders about how to be a better leader, you know, how to build teams better on and off the field. And um, I really feel like that opportunity helped us uh, when I came back. And obviously, you know, um, you know, winning the Super Bowl in 2017 makes me feel like I, I made the right decision. 
you know, you, you mentioned the Super Bowl it leads into my next question. Can you talk a little bit about goal setting, right? You've had a tremendous amount of success, both personally and professionally, as have the Eagles. And we all know it's hardest to get to the top of the mountain, but then how do you stay at the top of the mountain? How do you go through your day process of looking at how can I be the best GM, father, et cetera, on a daily basis? How do you set goals? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, I think when you're in these jobs, whatever field you're in, you have to have a competitive nature about you. You have to want to compete. Um, and and otherwise, you can't stay on top. You're going to get embarrassed. And so I think when you when you think you know, have all the answers, I think that's when you get your butt kicked. And, and so for us, I think it's just um, being inquisitive, um, trying to hire the best possible people around you, have the best people around you, and have open doors of communication for the best ideas. Um, I think anyone who thinks they can do anything on their own you know, doesn't understand what teams are all about and uh, doesn't understand how important ship teamwork is. And, I, and that's not just in the NFL. That's not just in sports. That's in life. You know, you need a team around you. You need a team of people around you who are looking out for your best interests, um, who are pushing you to do whatever it is that, that you want to do. And everyone deserves to have those kind of positive people around them. Well, you've had so much success, Howie. Um, and you, I think you hit it right on the head. And Mike's question was very valid. That to me, climbing to the top is much easier than staying there. And I know this will be a tough one, but I have to throw in a couple football ones. Um, how do you separate your management organization and your teams? It seems like you look at the draft and and trades a little bit different than other people. As you know, they're calling you the Wolf of Broad Street, and um, I, that, that's flattering. And you had such a great draft this year, and then of course you picked up Andre Swift, or DeAndre Swift uh, from the Lions, who I knew from St. Joe's Prep. But how, do you, how does your management and front office team separate themselves from the other front office teams in the league without giving away any of your secrets yeah obviously you know it's very cool when you talk about a guy like deandre swift st joe's prep kid philly kid he's recruitment video he's freaking on the rocky steps um and, and those are great stories but i think at the end of the day you know the hardest part of this is um you know you you're trying to pick the best team and you're not uh, I, I joke a lot of times, you know, someone will say, how hard is it to cut someone? And I said, well, you know, uh, when they're really good people and I'll say, well, the best person I know is my wife and I don't want her playing football for us either. So I think at the end of the day, we got a responsibility to make sure that not only we have really good people, but we have really good players. And so when we try to put the team together, we try to put it with a with um, kind of match it with personalities and obviously skill sets and. Um, I think at the end of the day, we got a responsibility to everyone to do that, but we also want the best people. So we want guys who can handle adversity, who when things are going bad, are able to overcome those things. And so I think the hardest thing we have to do is let people go and um, tell people that, you know, they, can, they can't play for us anymore. And Howie, thank you. We know your time is limited, but I wanted, and this is a big one, one final question for you, if you could really sort of share your thoughts. When we look at social media today, that's a big deal in sports, right? It's a big deal for professional athletes. It is a huge deal for high school athletes. Can you talk a little bit about how the Eagles organization handles that? You guys do a great job. We don't hear about things with the players getting in trouble, seeing inappropriate things on social media. Just as a, a football coach, as a businessman, if you could just talk a little bit about how you guys handle that, that would be great. Yeah, I think for us, you know, obviously it's a rabbit hole. It's a, it's a struggle for people of every age. I mean, I, I don't care if you're 60, if you're 30, if you're 20, if you're 15, it's hard to get off these phones. It's hard, it's hard to deal with it. But, you know, I think what, what people don't realize is these things don't go away. You know, we have draft picks who did things when they were 13 and 14 years old and they think they're gone and they have to answer those questions. And I think um, all of us want to represent ourselves in a professional way. And we'll understand we're representing our families. And so when you do things, when you put things out there, whether it's on a text message, whether it's on a social media app, those things are going to stay with you for life. And so you got to you got to remember in the heat of the moment what you're doing and what you're representing, because it's your brand. Everyone has their own brand these days. You don't have to be a famous athlete. Um, you don't have to be uh, anyone other than yourself to have a brand and know that employers are going to be looking at that. And you have to be careful what you do because it's going to follow you for the rest of your life. 
Thank you, Howie. We really appreciate you taking the time. And it was very generous of you. Um, let's give a hand to Howie Roseman. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, that was amazing. We're thrilled that he joined us. And uh, if he didn't have a busy schedule, he would have been up here today. So we're getting close to the end here. We've got three more uh, speakers. And I'm proud to announce uh, another young man, I call him young man, but he's probably just hit 40, and uh, one of my former players, and probably in my 25 years at CB West, I don't know if we had a guy who made a bigger splash in terms of toughness, talk about grit, um, just leadership at a young age, and it, it doesn't surprise us that he went into the field he did as a Special Forces leader. Uh, this is Brian Buckley. Brian played for us on the 96, 97, or excuse me, 97, 98, 99. Am I right, Brian, or is it? 97, 98. 97, 98, when they didn't lose a game, or we didn't lose a game in, in uh, that four-year stretch. And, uh, but Brian went to the University of Massachusetts on a full football ride. When 9-11 occurred, Brian was one of the, uh, one of the young men that said, I, I, I got to leave. I got to leave and stop what I'm doing and help this country out. He enlisted, and he'll tell you the whole thing, in, in the Marines. Or he actually went to Villanova and joined, uh, got into ROTC, enlisted into the Marines. Tried out for the Special Forces, not only made the Special Marine, they're called Marine Raiders, equivalent to the uh, Navy SEALs and the Army Rangers, but he became a captain. Led many, many uh, missions into Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, was wounded multiple times. Won many medals. Um, he's probably floating on cloud nine right now, but uh, Brian Buckley. All right, got all the answers here. My yellow notepad I stole from Ray Didinger. All right, guys. So, hey, good afternoon. I'm Brian Buckley. Who here knows who, like, show of hands, who's Yuri Gargarin? Who knows him? Raise your hand. All right. Who knows of a Kardashian? More people. Okay. So, Yuri Gargarin, he was a Soviet cosmonaut, and he's the first human being who was sent up into space and came back successfully. Um, pretty big deal, right? Could you imagine someone just saying to you, like, listen, I'm going to strap your backside to this rocket and send you up in space and we're going to bring you back. And he did it. So one thing, I mean, that's a pretty incredible thing he did. I would tell people, you know, look at your habits of what you kind of pay attention to. But also think about that crazy goal of saying, we're going to send you into space on this huge rocket. I mean, that's pretty crazy. And a lot of people say that's almost unimaginable, but not to everyone. So... A couple of things I want to hit on to you guys today is talking about, really, ever since the day you were born, it has always been you versus you, all right? And you can be really hard on yourself and be your own worst critic at times. Uh, you know, when I was playing at CB West, Coach Petten, he knew I was a mama's boy. Sometimes he couldn't get messages to me, so he would call my mom and kind of have it relayed to me. And one of the things he always got annoyed with me about was how hard I was on myself. But you can use that to your advantage. You can use that to help you find your passion, help you set goals. And one thing I really want to kind of hit you guys on is talking about fear versus faith. What is that? You know, with fear versus faith, I want to think of, um, you know, think of like a race car driver. When they're spinning out of control, they're not sitting there staring at the wall because what's going to happen? They're going to end up hitting the wall. They're looking for an open area where they can get out to, right? So the fear of not like, hey, I'm going to hit that wall, it's more of the faith of what do I have to do in order to get to where I want to be. And that's a pretty big thing that has helped me out throughout my entire life uh, when I really want to start setting goals. You know, I was trying to think of like, how do I kind of, people, I think people walk around like with a sense of entitlement lately. And, 
You know, I always look at things, the world owes you nothing, but it will provide you opportunities. And what you take of those opportunities is going to what defines you. You know, um, Dana Hahn. Oh, just caught you looking at your phone. Look at that one. All right, did I like football growing up? Stop being embarrassed. All right, that's good. Don't can't blame me on that one. But did I like football growing up? Okay, I loved football. I was obsessed with football. When I was coming through here at Lenape uh, Junior High, I mean, my entire goal, you know, I have Coach Ben said here, he, he'll validate this. I had a goal. I was going to start as a sophomore at CB West. Now, back then, your first year at West was 10th, 10th grade, unless you're Dave Armstrong, who went up as a freshman. But I was not interested in special teams, nothing like that. I had to get out in the field, and I had to start. And I did whatever it took. Um, you know, throughout the week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'd be at Riley Gym that used to be here in Doylestown. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I was a I had, I had speed, I was fast, I could beat pretty much every here, everyone here in my grade. I went up to CB West, I found a guy named Rafael Castillo, who was an 11th grader. I would go up and train with him in the hallways at West while my friends were out doing other things. Because I had a goal and I knew it was going to take me to be in that arena and I was going to be the one who had to get there and make it happen. And come up to West, moved pretty quickly, I was on varsity lifting quickly, I, was, I didn't play one snap on JV, they put me right up to varsity. And by the end of the first game, I was in the rotation, and the next week I had my first official start, and I was named Defensive Player of the Week. But those were goals that I had set that I was going to go out and get. Why? Because I believed in myself. I had faith. I wasn't thinking of the negative outcomes. I was just thinking the positive things I had to do to come along the way. You know, Coach Carey brought up, you know, I, um, you know when I, football was my life. When I went to the University of Massachusetts, I was, you know, making ground there. I was... Uh, Ended up starting towards the end of the season, my redshirt freshman year as a fullback. But during that year, that's when we uh, had an experience with September 11, 2001, or 9-11. And we'll never forget that day. We'll go down to the football complex, jump up on the table to get taped up. They're like, hey, we don't think we're going to tape today. We had three you know, big screen TVs in our locker room. Probably about a dozen guys from New York City on the team. You know, this is where I aged myself. Cell phones were not what they were then, what they are now. We were pretty much still tied to landlines, so they couldn't get a hold of anyone. So a lot of confusion. And ultimately, we didn't practice that day. I lived with five other uh, football players. We went out, got some adult beverages, and brought them back to the house, and we were just watching news like everyone else. And that's when you started seeing what was happening when people were throwing themselves out of, out of the World Trade Towers. And you just kind of had to sit there and think for a second, how bad of a situation are they in that they think this is their best course of action? And I'll never forget seeing this one uh, female. She threw herself out, and she was holding her dress as she was falling down. And something just spoke to me there where that was America. Um, she made a decision, and she was going to do it with dignity. And I know this sounds corny. I know it sounds cliche, but I literally got up, went into our bathroom, looked at myself in the mirror and said, time for me to go earn my citizenship. And from that point on, I knew which route I was gonna go. Didn't say anything to my roommates, didn't say anything to teammates, I finished the season. And that's when I started informing everyone I was gonna stop playing football and transfer to Villanova University and go into the ROTC program. When I uh, got, uh, graduated Villanova, I was commissioned a lieutenant in the Marine Corps, went into the infantry, First deployment was to Fallujah, Iraq. I came back, they said, hey, you did a really good job. Why don't you try out for this thing called Marine Reconnaissance? Went, tried out for that, made it. They sent me right back to Iraq six months later. When I returned from that deployment, we were getting our special operations uh, side stood up. They asked me to go take selection. Uh, about 300 of us went to selection, and at the end of the, uh, the whole entire process, there was about 25 of us left, and I was one of them. And I was uh, made into what they would call a team commander, and spent a majority of my time in the Marine Corps as a team commander, conducting deployments to uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, and also Afghanistan as well. When I was in Afghanistan, uh, the special operation units, we were doing two types of mission. They had village support uh, platforms. We had Navy SEALs, Marine Raiders, Green Berets. They were dressed up in the traditional Afghan dress, fully bearded out living in the villages with the people and standing up local police forces, building wells, basically to give them a point to kind of survive on their own. 
build up security in our own local economy. My team was tasked out to be the commando mission. So in the middle of the night, we would be on the black helicopters with every aircraft you can think of above us, and we would fly in to go after high-value Taliban targets. Uh, we weren't there to shake hands or you know kiss babies. If you got a, a you know if you raided a meeting with us, it was going to be a pretty intense moment. And uh, you know I never forget we're flying into this one mission in this area called uh, Kaligas, which actually was pretty much the capital of the Taliban in the Helmand province. You know, as we're flying in, you could see an early warning network. Basically, Taliban people would come out with torches and just kind of throw them up in the air, and there would be a connecting file to follow the sound of the helicopters to where we were so they could meet us on the ground. As we're coming in, we're about 300 feet off the deck. We're whizzing in through canyons, and that's when the laser light show starts happening, and you start seeing all the uh, ammunition, uh, small arms fire, and rocket-propelled grenades coming up at us. Uh, we came in under fire. Um, it was a pretty pretty hellish moment, I would say, but we were just kind of keeping calm, doing what we had to do, problem solved, and moved on, but I remember just saying to myself, man, this mission, we're going to earn our stories on this one, and uh, the next day, we're just in a fighting position, and, uh, you know, I just never forget, I'm talking to one of my corpsmen, and it was just a hot July day, I mean, it's like 120 degrees, like 99% humidity, just miserable. And I'm like, boy, I could go for an ice-cold Coca-Cola right now. And as soon as I said that, this basically it was called an underbrow grenade launcher. A grenade just flew by my head. It sounded like a you know, fly ball, like a baseball going by you. And it happened real fast, but I did have that moment where I, I just thought to myself, they got me. And the thing cranked off right next to me, basically sent shrapnel all throughout the left side of my body, uh, including the left side of my head. Uh, my corpsman, he lost part of his tricep, and our dog handler took shrapnel inside his stomach, which he literally woke up two weeks ago in Bethesda, Maryland, having no idea what just happened. But when that kicked off, um, it, it was just a very complex firefight. I've been in a lot of gunfights in my life, but this one just had a little bit more intensity to it. You know, I definitely know what it's like to be in a popcorn machine now. Uh, the ground underneath of me was just popping up all around me. Uh, it literally looked like giants put their hands on the tree line and shaking it. There was just so much small arms fire and rocket propelled grenades and mortars and everything coming at us. And I'm wounded at this point. Um, a lot of blood coming out from my left leg. Uh, but it was, you know, this is where it gets weird, right? I just started, I wasn't at all at any moment thinking, oh God, I'm shot or anything like that. It didn't really matter at that point. Now, a ton of adrenaline hit me, so I had to take a moment to just kind of couple deep breaths and just calm down. But from there, I just started looking at the battlefield and just started problem solving and talking with my teammates. You know, I told them, you know, I called my higher command, let them know what was going on uh, that we're about to be overran. And we just started going through the problem sets. And next thing you know, the enemy that started that fight, they no longer walk on the earth and we all made it out of there. Why? Because we had faith in each other. We had faith in what we were going to do. And that's just things that helped me get through life and helped me kind of get to where I am today, and there's still a lot more goals to be had. You know, and when I bring up those stories, and a lot of times people always come up to me, they, they want to thank me for my service, and, I, and it's greatly appreciated. But no one owes me anything. Uh, you know, I want to thank you for letting me serve. You know, for me, it was tremendous honor to do that. You know, I want to thank you guys for having the faith in us that every time you went down to go lay your head on a pillow, you knew you were safe because we had to watch, and no one was going to touch you that night because we would do the unimaginable to keep you safe. You know, and at the end of the day, thank you for giving me, you know, the honor of a lifetime. Not everyone gets to serve with their heroes, but I did. And people ask me, what's some of the, like, medals and things you've won? Well, the best medals I ever had, I wear in my heart every day. <clears throat> it's the men that I got to serve with. Again, not everyone gets to serve with their heroes, but I did. And, you know, this guys just kind of wrap this thing up. You know, again, thank you, and I, you know, thank you for being Doyle Sound. This place means so much to me. And you know, at the end of the day, guys, you know, thank you for showing up here. It's a really big deal. It's the little things that are going to make the difference in your guys' life. You know, and I want to leave you with this: We have a Marine Reconnaissance Creed, and at the end of it, it says, "A recon Marine can speak without saying a word and achieve what others can only imagine." Go forward with that mindset. I'm telling you, it's going to pay off dividends for you. 
You can run, you can lift, you can do all that stuff, but if you don't have the right mindset, nothing's going to happen for you. And I promise you, as I'm sitting on a stage, which I'm now kind of regretting because I have to get up and I'm a little bit old and cranky, but we'll make it work. In a couple years, you will hear about what my, me and my team have done where we're helping out on veterans' medical health. I'm going to change the medical landscape of this country, I promise you. Why? Because I have faith in myself, I have faith in my team, I know how I'm, I'm going to accomplish my goals. So hey, just want to say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for Coach Carey for putting this on. We'll be able to talk a little bit later. Have a great day. We'll talk soon. <laughs> Buck, we appreciate you. Everyone has ever been in service. We thank you as well. There aren't enough words to, uh, to thank you for being here today and what you've done for us. So shift over to our next speaker. Um, I could be up here again all day talking about awards and accolades. Um, I had the unenviable task uh, over the years of trying to guard her six foot ten father in recreational basketball leagues. Not fun. Uh, I think I'd like to guard Maddie Burke even less, to be honest with you. It's too too much for my ego, Chris. But uh, Maddie Burke, okay, a name that most of you probably recognize. She is a local legend as far as basketball goes. Men or women, it doesn't matter. Maddie has achieved it. She's currently starring down at Villanova after starting her career at Penn State. She's the all-time leading scorer at Central Bucks West, 6A Player of the Year. I could go on and on and on. More importantly, let's let Maddie talk about herself. Give a big, warm round of applause for my girl, Maddie Burke. Um, first of all, I want to, can you ask me? I just want to say that um, it's amazing to be here, um, especially with uh, Ray Didinger. I used to listen to you every morning with my father um, coming to school at Lenape uh, for about three years, so it's, it's an honor and a privilege. Um, I'm so happy to be speaking at Lenape with you guys today because it is where I went to school. I was sitting in those very seats you were sitting in not so long ago and roaming around these halls. I actually remember the first day here at Lenape because I was the new kid. The only friends I have were on the basketball team, they're all older than me. I walked in wearing my Nike basketball shorts, basketball shoes, and a Nike t-shirt, just being myself. Something that growing up I was never afraid to do. I started playing basketball at the YMCA right across the street from here when I was five. And from there I began playing for Lenape Valley for a team that was a year older than I was throughout elementary school. With that I played travel baseball as well with all the boys, which then carried over into my middle school years where I played for Lenape Middle School a girls travel team, and a boys travel team as well. Now that I'm really looking back on how many teams I was on, it's really crazy. Um, I, didn't, I never really had a lot of free time to do what my classmates were doing on the weekends and missing out on a lot of hangouts with my friends, like going to Nats getting pizza or even Annie's to get water ice. As much as I missed out on because of basketball, the business of my schedule was what really kept me afloat through what was going on beyond the smile that I brought to my peers every single day. Throughout my childhood, I dealt with, with the hardship of addiction in my family that led me to wanting to be anywhere but home, which is what led me right to the gym, constantly working out and striving to, the, to be the best player that I could be. Finding a passion for something to distract me from my struggles that I have with my family is what pushed me through it all, whether that be a sport, playing an instrument, painting, or whatever each of your passions are. Spending late, late nights and early mornings at the gym with trainers and my teammates before school, after school, were the times that I will never forget. When that alarm went off in the morning, it took everything in me not to hit snooze and just get up at the same time as everybody else to go to school in the morning. But not hitting snooze on those early mornings was one of the best decisions I've made in my life. Having basketball my life had become a vehicle for me, which is something I learned from a coach at a very young age. A vehicle that led me to meet my best friends that will last a lifetime, that are still sisters to me till this day and I met here at Lenape. A vehicle that has led me to travel all over the country before I even got to go to college, going to Colorado, Illinois, Tennessee, Texas, etc. A, ve a vehicle that has led me to be able to speak at such an amazing event as this and to such bright young kids and alongside these amazingly accomplished people. Working so hard throughout my childhood led me to be able to choose what universities I wanted to be able to attend on a full scholarship to play basketball and get an education as well. I wanted to play my first two years of college basketball at Penn State where I was on the all-freshman team and was sixth player of the year. In my years there, I made lifelong friends and some amazing memories but there were some challenges that led me to the decision to transfer schools, which is where I'm at today at Villanova University, just down the road. I miss Philly so much that I had to come back. 
This past year, we made it to the Sweet 16 at the NCAA tournament, as well as being ranked 10th in the country. Making this decision to transfer was one of the hardest things I had to do, but easily one of the best decisions I've made for myself. With the hardships of coping with addiction in my family, I had a great outlet with basketball and sports. Along with that, I saw professional counseling and ride on loving, trusting adults in my life to help me deal with my feelings in a healthy way. I am so grateful to be able to, to be beside this amazing group and to be able to speak with you all today. Thank you. Great job, Maddie. All right, we're at the last uh, video here and the last speaker who will be Colin Gillespie. I mentioned him before. Colin is a uh, Northeast Philadelphia guy, went to Archbishop Wood when I first met him. Again, he was a safety and quarterback on our team there. And then his senior year, um, I'll never forget it. He came up to me and said, Coach, I got to talk to you. And I said, what's up, Colin? And he said, uh, I'm going to specialize in basketball. Well, if you know my passion for football, it, that meeting did not go over well. But he, look, in hindsight, he made the right decision by far uh, in his life. And, uh, you know, I just, I didn't see it at that point. Um, he did start at point guard his senior year at Wood, had no offers until he got into the state finals, or excuse me, the state playoff game. And then in the semifinals, when Wood was playing, I believe it was Roman, um, Against the advice of the assistant coaches at Villanova, Jay Wright came and watched them, and at halftime told the head coach at Villanova, or excuse me, at Archbishop Wood, I want that guy to play for Villanova. I'm going to give him a full ride. So he got a full ride there, went to Villanova. The rest is kind of history. Had an amazing career, won a national title, and ended up being uh, Bob Cousy, get the Bob Cousy award as the best point guard his senior year at Villanova went undrafted uh, into the NBA and signed with Denver Nuggets, played in their summer league, and was player of the, of the year for the Denver Nuggets, and now is on the active roster again uh, for the Denver Nuggets. And Colin will tell you the story here, and he's battled injury after injury. Um, he's got a compelling story, Colin Gillespie. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Colin Gillespie from the Denver Nuggets, um, former graduate of Archbishop Wood uh, in 2017 and recent graduate of Villanova University in 2021. Um, it's my first year out of school. I, I graduated two years ago. I took my fifth year um, at school. But um, first, I want to thank Coach Carey and uh, the Penn Foundation for uh, putting this on for you guys and allowing you to hear uh, from other people and their stories and um, hopefully uh, you guys can connect with one of them and uh, just learn and grow from it. Um, I know that's what I did and uh, my journey it was very different but I'm extremely grateful for every part of it. I've learned a lot about myself and uh, I was able to grow and learn a lot from it so I'm extremely grateful but like I said uh, I graduated from Archbishop Wood in, in 2017 um, I was a two-sport athlete for two years, and then I decided to focus mainly on basketball and uh, pursue that uh, collegiately at the next level. So um, it wasn't easy to give up. It was my first love, but um, you kind of just got to make decisions in life that are tough. And uh, it was a really tough decision, and it was really hard for me because I love football, but it was in my best interest. So that was what I decided to do. Um, I was very under recruited. I didn't have many scholarship offers until I was a senior. And then I finally got an offer from Villanova, which was uh, not my dream school, but um, I actually grew up not liking Villanova at all, which is kind of funny be the way it turned out. But um, I'm extremely grateful for my entire journey there and everything that they have done for me. And um, I was able to learn a lot about myself uh, and grow a lot from just my five years there. But like I said, um, I, I was very under recruited and I got my scholarship offer when I was a senior in high school. Uh, it was the best decision that I ever made to decide to go to Villanova University. It was close to home. Um, and I, my family got to see me play. I got to play at the highest level, which was amazing. Um, and I just grew up a lot there. Uh, I became a man. 
Um, I went through a lot of different things, injuries, uh, mental health stuff. Uh, my so sophomore, junior year, uh, dealing with a lot of anxiety, depression, and uh, I was able to kind of lean on my teammates, my coaches, my family to get me through hard times. But um, I also had to go through it myself and um, I had to learn a lot about myself and, and how to deal with certain things. But I came out on the other end and um, I'm extremely grateful uh, to have gone through it because now I know more about myself um, than I did before. And um, I've also experienced a lot of injuries while playing sports. Uh, I tore my MCL my senior year at Villanova, which was really hard uh, because I wanted to go professionally after my senior year, but I ended up having to go back for my fifth year, which was one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Uh, just being able to focus on myself um, on and off the floor in my fifth year was, was really important for my development, my growth, uh, not only as a player, but as a person as well. You learn a lot about yourself when you have a lot of free time. Um, and I was just able to learn and grow uh, in, in that space and in that time, which was really important for me. Um, and then previous, like really recently, I, I broke my leg right before um, my rookie season would have started, um, which was a dream of mine to get to this level and play at this level. So um, it was really tough going through that. But like I said, you lean on others, uh, family, friends to get you through those tough times. And um, I've obviously gone through some tough things. So I, I've uh, acclimated myself well to just being in tough environments, tough situations, and kind of just growing and learning from it, just stacking good days, uh, getting a little bit better each day. Um, and then by the end, you'll come out, you'll be better from it, and uh, you'll be stronger because of it. So um, just know that everybody's journey is different. Um, don't wish for anybody else's and uh, just go through yours. Uh, be grateful for every opportunity that you have. Um, the greatest gift that we have is waking up every day um, and being healthy and um, never take that for granted because there's other people in the world that uh, don't get that opportunity like we do every day. So um, just live your life and um, live it to the fullest. Go through your journey um, and anything that you put your mind to, uh, you can accomplish. So um, keep a great attitude through everything you do. Work extremely hard and um, chase your dreams and I'm sure whatever you guys put your minds to and, and whatever you guys chase you guys will be super successful at so um, thank you for listening to my story hopefully um, you guys can take something from it um, and, and apply it to yours but uh, good luck with everything thank you for listening I wish I could have been there with you guys today but thank you So that concludes our program. We are now going to go into the classrooms. And uh, again, you can visit one classroom, you can visit two, three, it's all up to you. So uh, I just can't tell you how much we appreciate you showing up and I wanna thank the tremendous group of people we had. You guys all did a great job. I do wanna just say one thing here uh, before we leave. I wanna introduce we have three other speakers that did not speak that will be in the classroom. The first one is Bob Bell. Bob, Bob's here. Bob is, um, Bob is a Warrington uh, police officer. Bob also played for me in the late 80s. Late 80s, and uh, I've known Bob since he's been a, him and his brother. Since they've been very young, Bob is uh, on the SWAT team and also works at CB South. We have Jenna Vaughn Lloyd, who, I said that right? Who is a CB West graduate. Did you go to Lenape? So she went to here, went to CB West, was a swimmer in the cross? Swimmer in tennis. Sw swimmer in tennis. Um, but more so, she was a great student, went into medicine. She's now a local PA right here in Chalfont. Another one that went into the medical field. And then Mike. <laughs> Mike Bonomo Bonanna. That's it. <laughs> Mike was a local Doylestown guy. I actually met him at Mount Carmel Church, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe, eight years ago. Mike is an Archbishop Wood grad. 
And uh, Mike is another one that went into the uh, pharmaceutical, or went into the business world, and then got a calling that he had it, he wanted to serve our country. I actually hooked him up, I don't know if it was before or after, I hooked him up with Brian Buckley, which probably was the worst thing. Brian just <laughs> corrupted his mind, but uh, he went into the Marines, ended up being a platoon uh, leader of one of the Marine Corps, and now is back working for Merck, in the oncology, leading in uh, Merck Pharma's oncology department. Yeah. Uh, so Mike, phenomenal. <laughs> so that's it. I'm just so excited that uh, you showed up and we're gonna go into the classrooms if you wanna join us. Otherwise, thank you so much. Thanks,